Yes, sir. I think we need to begin. Um, I don't know a lot of you here. My name is Duart Timothy. I was the former owner of Pulse Sound up until a year or so ago um, <clears throat> and have been uh, in the audio business uh, most of my life. And so um, they kind of nabbed me to, to show you a few things that you probably won't see anywhere else. Um, be, before we actually start on the uh, presentation, uh, let me get over here to done something wrong here. Sorry, we set this uh, a couple hours ago and I think the computer went to sleep. So uh, bear with me a second. Okay, so what uh, Aaron asked me to do today was to talk on uh, power amps. <clears throat> uh, before we get started on that, though, um, I'd like to talk to you about a few things, uh, and that is that uh, 
audio industry is one where um, you can kind of get told a lot of lies. Um, there are a lot of these come from uh, what they're trying to do is to sell equipment. So marketing departments will make up s some slang term or say something is it, the way that it is when it really isn't. And then that gets passed down to the sales reps and then that goes to the dealers. And then, uh, and so you get bombarded with this all the time. I call them crab legs. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever had crab legs, but they bring out this uh, plate full of crab legs, you know, usually about a half pound or so, and you break them open and you pull the meat out and you get pull this little sliver of meat out and then you take what's left and put it onto a plate. Um, and it, by, the by the end of the meal, you've eaten a very small amount of crab and you've got a big, big plate of garbage. And, and that's, ex that's, what, that's exactly what happens in, the, in, in our industry is that we, we get filled full of garbage from a lot of things. And the whole purpose of these uh, seminars is to uh, kind of weed that out for you guys. So nothing you ever hear from me uh, will ever contain any crab legs. Um, everything I'm going to talk to you about is are things that, in my 57 years of, in the audio business, things that actually happen. Okay, and things, that, information that you'll actually use, um, or that is pertinent to what you're doing. You may not. You may not go in. You may never. Like, for instance, we're going to measure an amplifier for uh, power, and you may never do that, but at least you'll understand, you know, what this relationship is, what power relationship is to, uh, to everything else that you're doing. So that being said, um, audio power amplifiers... So what they do, they call them an amplifier because they take a little signal that comes out of your mixer and they boost it or amplify it to what can power a speaker. But they really don't amplify. Um, there's no way that they're gonna take this little signal, the same signal that's on this wire right here, and put it out the speaker terminals. What they do do is they, um, they recreate the signal several times within the amplifier itself. So you've got an analog signal coming into it, and then it's recreated into a larger signal within the amplifier and until finally a larger signal that's strong enough to power the speaker. And this recreation um, sometimes is not really accurate. You've, you can hear some amplifiers that sound one way and other amplifiers that sound another way. There's small differences and it all comes from the recreation of the signal. And so don't ever, don't ever believe that you're really amplifying, you're not, you're really recreating. And when we get into talking about digital, that's where it, it can really go awry, you know. But we'll talk about both analog and digital. So from the beginning, um, ampli there's always been two goals in designing amplifiers. Um, because the very first ones were amplifiers where, number one, they wouldn't produce any more than 10 watts. And number two is to produce the 10 watts, they drew 100 watts out of the wall socket. Um, 
so th the design goals have always been to, number one, uh, amplify the signal accurately, but then the number two goal has always been to increase the efficiency. And uh, the original amplifiers were, um, well, th this, this is kind of hard to explain, so let me think of it. Really. Well, before, before, we, before I talk about that, I'm going to talk about the sections within the amplifier itself. Um, number one is you have a power supply. Um, the power supply takes power from the wall, uh, divides it up into either small sections for uh, powering the small circuitry within the amplifier or very high current, high power uh, sections for powering the output. So the amplifier is usually a standalone module, or the power supply is a standalone module, and uh, it supplies power for all of the rest of this. And this, this becomes very important, as we'll discuss here in a minute. The second part you have is the input section. That's the part where the signal from the mixer comes and plugs in. Uh, and then inputs can be uh, just straight analog or they can be digital. And then digital covers um, all of the different di digital signals, A AES, Dante, AVB, and <clears throat> those signals there are, the, the input deals with all of those in, and converts them to a manner that the amplifier can deal with. So the input section is, is one complete module that comes in, inside of the, this part of the amplifier. Uh, the input section is also designed to provide the right levels for the rest of the amplifier. That's all that was going to say. And so another section is the pre-driver. In a class A and class B amplifier, the pre-driver is uh, pretty important. This is where a lot of the signal boost comes from or, or the amplification. Um, then the driver, and that's in class, the driver, both the pre-driver and the driver are used in class A through C amplifiers. And don't worry, I'll explain classes to you here in a second. Um, and then the driver is, is uh, the one that goes just before the outputs. And then you have the output section. The driver also separates the positive and negative parts of the signal. And I think I should probably explain that now. Um, I drew this here up earlier. And this would be zero line. And part of your signal is positive and part of your signal is negative. And, um, this is, this is true for any signal that, you know, my talking here right now, part of, the, part of the peaks go positive and part of the peaks go negative. And so all signals are this way. Um, sorry, I, I haven't done this in a long time and I'm, I'm sort of out of practice on it. And the outputs, the output in it varies per class. Uh, the size and number of outputs uh, together determine the power of the amplifier. There's another part in the amplifier, it's called the negative feedback loop. And I, I know this may be a little confusing to you right now, but they take part of the output of the amplifier and they feed it back into the input of the amplifier. So we use, we use a, 
symbol like this to show amplifier. This would go to the speaker. And they take part of this output and then they feed it back into the input. Uh, and what that does is has, um, <clears throat> has the effect of taking the distortion that comes out of the amplifier back to the input so the amplifier can compensate for the distortion. So the negative feedback loop is the way that they get rid of most of the distortion. Now some manufacturers, uh, we sell a manufacturer called, um, who makes the, who, who's the manufacturer makes the electrostatic? I can't, I can't think of it now. Alcons, Alcons. Yeah, we sell Alcons, and uh, Alcons has, a, they, they take their negative feedback loop all the way, they let it go through the speaker wire, and so you're taking it right off the input of the speaker and feeding it back. So it's compensating not only for distortion in the amplifier, but it's also compensating for losses in the speaker wire. And Alcons isn't the only one that does that. There, there are a number of uh, manufacturers that do, most, mostly in the hi-fi industry. Okay. Yeah. By the way, if you, if you have any questions, just, just pipe up and ask them. Um, <clears throat> by saying negative feedback loop, that indicates that it goes back out of phase. Uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with the phase of the amplifier. So, uh, we've already talked about the signal properties. I need to talk a little bit about power supplies. I think I got my slides out of, out of line, so I should have spent some more time on power supplies. Um, I've got two amplifiers sitting here. This one came out of the Marriott Center. This is a 60-pound amplifier, and it's heavy. We used to, uh, we used to have to lift these around in the old days. This amplifier here is only 800 watts per channel. Okay. Most of the weight is because of the power supply. They have a huge transformer in there because to supply enough current to create 800 watts is, it, it takes a beefy power supply. Um, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but this is a modern power supply. This is also 800 watts and weighs less than a pound. And I'll, I'll explain to you how that works um, in a few minutes when we talk about class D amplifiers. Um, so this is progress. This amplifier being big and heavy, new amplifiers just aren't that way. And the reason they're not that way, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second here. Okay, we've talked about signal properties. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, amplifier classes. And uh, this is very, uh, this is evolved because the original amplifiers were, um, just built like anything else, and they didn't really have classes. And the, the, but the original ones um, were very, like I said, were very, very inefficient. And so they, they started to, to change the circuitry. And as they changed the circuitry, they elected to begin to talk to it about to talk about classes of amplifier. And so when you say an amplifier class, it's just a description of the circuitry. Um, now, there, in, in recent times, there have been a lot of new types of amplifiers out, and so people wanted to assign them classes. But from what I can tell, 
they've really stopped assigning them classes, and it, it's just the, that they are uh, making them go under one of the other classes that already exist. And the whole purpose of design, again, is to increase this efficiency. Um, for instance, the 10 watt amplifier that I talked about before, drawing 100 watts out of the wall, uh, you know, this is, a, this is an 1800 watt amplifier, or a six, excuse me, a 1600 watt, 800 per channel, and uh, it draws 30 amps out of the wall. Uh, I lost myself there. And it began back in the tube days. Um, okay, so tubes, tubes operated a lot different than transistors do, but in, in reality, the classes of amplifiers in the, in the tube days were the same as they are in the, in the solid state days. So that's the only reason I made that note on the slide. And there is this thing we call biasing. Um, a transistor or a tube doesn't conduct unless you tell it to conduct. And what makes them so efficient is if they're conducting all the time, they're drawing current all the time. And so uh, biasing just tells the tube when to conduct or tells the transistor when to conduct. Um, biasing only takes place uh, mostly in class B amplifiers, or class AB amplifiers, but I'll get into that here in just a second as we... Class A amplifier is one where the transistor, I'm going to say transistors because you guys don't know anything about tubes. Um, but the trans, just you? Oh, they're making a comeback, by the way. <clears throat> but a class A amplifier is where the transistor is turned on all the time. Any signal that comes into that transistor is amplified, both the positive and the negative parts of it. And so, um, when they talk about class A, that's all it is, is just that you know that that amplifier is turned on all, all the time. Now, since it's turned on all the time, uh, it, it's inefficient. So class A is very inefficient. So some, some of the engineers came up with what they call a class B amplifier. Well, uh, class B, takes one set of outputs that amplifies this part of the signal, another set of amplify outputs that, that amplify this part of the signal. And the transistor is only turned on when it's amplifying this. So otherwise it's off. So you can see how efficiency came up by the fact that they're just not on all the time. They're only on when either the positive or the negative part of the signal comes in. Um, the problem with Class B amplifiers, when these first came out, uh, you know, we, we bought a few and they didn't last very long because they have this problem where, well, if I'm biasing this one on uh, in the positive half from there to there, and then I bias this one on in the, in the bottom half, you can hear when they change. It's, it's a distortion. And so class B just didn't really last very long. Um, class AB came along, that's the next one, where guys said, well, okay, if that's what's happening, why don't we turn this part of the thing on earlier? So they come down here and they turn the positive on, they come here, 
and they turn the negative on. So when it goes through the crossover point uh, of this wave, you, you can't hear it because it's turned on. And it's only a very slight um, compromise in the efficiency of, this, of the amplifier. So that was class AB. Class C um, was used more or less for tuned circuits. Um, we'll talk about this a lot when we get into um, talking about loudspeakers, but Mother Nature never gives you anything except resonance. Resonance is something that Mother Nature gives you for free. And you know what a resonant is. If you blow, if you blow across the pop bottle, it whistles. Uh, those are resonances. Res you know, you've seen these videos of bridges that have gotten into this motion and shaking and completely shake the part because of the resonance of the bridge. But that's something that happens in Mother Nature. Now, for amplifiers, there's hardly any benefit to it unless you're building something that needs this resonance, you know. And so class C amplifiers are used more or less for, uh, they can be used with audio like a, a, a signal generator or something of that nature that, that's putting out an oscillator of some kind. Uh, so that they're used a lot in that. Uh, but you won't ever find them an amplifier like this in a class C. The real revolution happened when class D came along. And it just happened that the next class down that they could pick was class D, but it also is very nice because D stands for digital. So this is the first time that the when, when these amplifiers came were, were the first time that they deviated from amplifying the analog signal. The way that a class D works is that they pulsate or they convert the signal from analog into digital and then they send the digital down to turn off uh, output transistors at a very high rate of speed. It's like 250,000 times a second. I mean, it's a very, very high rate. Um, and so they're turning these off. And then the pulse width, so as they call it pulse width modulation, how long is the, because digital is just ones and zeros. That's all it is. It's either on or off. Uh, so how do you, you know, pulse width is what determines the, the modulation, so the audio comes in, creates different widths of, of things, and uh, that's what determines um, the audio. The problem is, is that you get it to the back of the amplifier, and you're trying to listen to 250,000 kilohertz, or 250 kilohertz, it's just not cutting it. Um, because you, you can't hear that high. You can only hear to, to 20 kilo, 20,000 hertz. And so they have to take and filter it. And when they filter out the digital portion of it, all that's left is the audio. And so that's the way class D amplifiers work. And I might say that all of the classes beyond D have some sort of this digital switching in them, where they're switching things on and off. Uh, it's not always the signal, however. Um, but the other big thing that came out of, of digital is, since they have to, to convert this, they have to produce this high sampling rate, or you know, this 250 kilohertz, um, they can do that prior to the power supply. 
So where this amplifier needs a transformer that's this big to get 800 watts, this amplifier doesn't. And it's because what goes into these tra uh, transformers is such a high frequency. And so along with the Class D amplifier came the switching power supply. That's what they call a switching power supply. <clears throat> Any questions on Class D? Because I, I know I, I probably didn't explain it. It's been a couple, it's been years since I did this, and I know I'm forgetting some things to tell you. So I'm relying on you to, to raise your hand and ask the questions if you have any. Yes? Are the power conditioners class D? The power conditioners? Like Bergen's and stuff? Oh, no, no, no. They're, they work strictly on 60 cycles out of the wall. No, and they wouldn't be a tournament. They wouldn't be given a class anyway. Um, class D explains the amplifier, doesn't really explain the power supply. Because we saw some class AB amplifiers come out that had switching power supplies in them um, with, with a little bit of difference. Um, let's go on with this. Class F is not, is a, it's a, Similar to class um, C, it's not really used for audio, but it, it's digital. It's a digital version of class C. Class G is interesting because they go back to doing an analog amplifier in class G, but it has a switching power supply. Now, the virtue of that is, is that they can switch in different rail voltages. So for instance, if you're playing, if you're playing a very soft uh, song or something like that, the amplifier doesn't have to put out a lot of power. So it's, it's taking a smaller rail voltage in order to do that. And you know, to produce the less power, a smaller rail voltage. And by rails, I mean th that the rail is, the, is what the, the power supply puts out. That's, that's the top and the bottom of what it puts out. Um, but if they can switch them down, they can conserve power. So again, class G amplifiers went up in efficiency um, because they were switching the power supply. But it was a switch from either this one or this one. Um, in class H, they made this continuously variable. So the power supply put out the voltage according to the signal that was going into it. So that was class H. Class T um, is a class H amplifier, but this company, TriPath, uh, developed a chip that would take and uh, the input signal and uh, optimize it for switching on and off. It uses a lot of DSP. Uh, TriPath went out of business, and I don't know, they're still putting out Class T amplifiers. You just typically find them in uh, very small I don't think I have one here, but very small, like battery operated things. Uh, those are all, most of them are class T amplifiers. Now you're gonna run across specifications a lot and this is where the, the lies start to come in or the I shouldn't say lies, maybe, but non-truths or uh, exaggerations, maybe that's a good way to put it, come in because manufacturers will do that um, in order to get, uh, <clears throat> for instance, um, well, I think I've got that further in here. 
So output power is one specification that you will see. But you kind of have to know how it was derived. Um, we have this thing called RMS power. And what RMS power is, is um, the positive part of this cycle here is not always high, and it's not always at zero. It's something in between, you know, because it's, it's doing more energy up here than it is down here, but how do you figure out what it is? And it's, so RMS power, it stands for root mean square, and it is taking the average power of this part of the wave, RMS down here. Um, so some, some manufacturers will say our output is, say, 100 watts RMS, and some manufacturers will say it's a 100-watt amplifier, and they won't tell you, but it, they're referring to peak-to-peak, -peak, and peak-to-peak -peak is not what you hear. Uh, it, it is there, and it may be a small part of what you hear because it deals with the transience of the signal as it comes through. But uh, most RMS is the true way to do it. Uh, be, and so when you talk about out, output power, uh, you need to kind of take a look at that. But most manufacturers in the commercial industry, uh, our industry, don't, they don't do peak to peak. It's only the hi-fi guys who are playing the spec wars that do, that you, where you see that. Now we have input sensitivity. <clears throat> How many volts do you have to put to the input to get this thing to go to full power? And this is also a big controversy or difference between commercial and, and uh, uh, hi-fi. Hi-fi, their standard is one volt. You get one volt out of the mixer. But a lot of mixers put out a lot more than that they'll put out 10 volts, 11 volts. Um, that's, that's more the commercial amplifiers are that way because the commercial mixers do that. Uh, little, if you take a little CD player, it, it'll only put out one volt at, at its maximum. And if you plug that into a commercial amplifier, you're not gonna, <clears throat> you're not gonna drive it to its full capacity. Um, it, it'll, it'll just sound soft. Distortion is another one. When you're powering the amplifier and it's below clipping, and we'll, we'll show you clipping here in a minute, how much distortion does it have? Um, the spec wars say the lower this number is, you know, the better off you are, and that's what the hi-fi people try to, to do is uh, uh, they play these spec wars with, uh, with uh, and try to get their distortion as low as we can. In practicality, if you can get less than 1%, you can't hear it. Signal to noise is <clears throat> if you turn the amplifier all the way down, you can hear a quiescent noise out of it. How much, how much above that is, will the amplifier's maximum be? Um, if you can get 100, you're doing really good. Some digital stuff now goes above 100. Some analog stuff goes above 100. You know, but 100 dB. I mean, <clears throat> if you're at a if you're at a concert, uh, you hear a dynamic range. If it's a rock concert, your dynamic range is only 30 dB. A classical concert may be as much as 60, and your amplifier do 100. You know, they're so far they're so far better than what you will ever run across, as long as you've got the gain set. And we'll talk about gains at another point. Um, a lot of them specify input impedance. And the reason for this 
is that in the early days, you had to mat you had to do impedance matching. Um, nowadays, you don't have to worry about it. So I don't know that we'll even talk about impedance matching because I doubt any of you will ever run across that. But they talk they put in input impedance on a lot of specifications just in case you're going to you need to match the impedance on the input. In the old days, you had your filters were transformers and they had to work at a certain impedance and so you had to know what the input impedance of your amplifier is. Nowadays it typically doesn't mean anything and typically those numbers will run up to 20,000 ohms. Um, it's just insignificant because your mixer, your mixer source is only 50 ohms typically. So it's, but, but you may run across it. Damping factor is something interesting. Um, <clears throat> you do run across it, and they, they, they talk about this more in the hi-fi industry than they do in the commercial industry, but if you get a, a speaker cone, if you hit it with a pulse, it'll say go out or go in, uh, depending on whether it's a positive pulse or a negative pulse. When that pulse goes away, the speaker doesn't stay in that position. It goes, it's got, it's got elasticity to it, so the, the surround is sucking it back in or pushing it back out between the surround and the spider. So once the pulse hit, the speaker hasn't stopped. It's still producing signal. Um, you, you can minimize that by shorting the speaker out because speakers are generators uh, and I can show you that you know on, on a scope you can run the push the speaker in and out and you can see the voltage that it creates well it's pushing that voltage back into the amplifier and uh, the amplifier has to deal with it somehow and typically that is done by having lower impedance outputs so that the amplifier looks like a short. Um, and that's, that's what damping factor is. You're, you're damping the motion of the speaker. And, you know, and, and so, and it's typically done by the fact that if you were to push this in and out, you'd get a resistance if the terminals were shorted. And so feeding it back into the amplifier, uh, you know, most, most lar least larger amplifiers, uh, they're, they're almost a short to the speaker anyway, you know. But they put a number to that, and that's called the damping factor. Um, another thing that can uh, affect damping factor is speaker wire length. Uh, because speaker wire, even though it's wire, it has a resistance to it. Um, and so if you, if you say, running an 8 ohm speaker and you run enough wire to get 1 ohm in the wire, then you've just thrown all your damping factor out the window because you're no longer looking back at a short. It's one of the main reasons, besides the loss that you get in wire, um, there one of the reasons why you want to do it is it keeps the damping, keep it short is because it keeps the damping factor up. So again, it's something that is used more in, um, in the hi-fi industry. One I didn't put on here, but which is just as valid is, is frequency response. Uh, frequency response, you know, we hear from 20 to 20,000. Some people claim they can hear more. Some people claim they can hear lower. Um, I don't know. It's it's all twenty to twenty thousand has been the industry standard for a long time. Seventy volt amplifiers. I, I didn't know where to plug this in, but uh, to the presentation. But seventy volt amplifiers, uh, instead of their power being optimized at a lower impedance, their power is optimized at a higher impedance. Uh, because, w and we can do a whole two hours on 70 volt, but just know if you run across the specification that says it's a, 
70 volt, it has a certain amount out into 70 volt that, that it's meant to drive more higher than an 8 ohm speaker. It's meant to drive a higher impedance line. So I just touch on that. In reality, it's two hours worth of ex explaining. In um, amplifiers are rated in their power output, but power, problem with this is that power is something you can't, you can't put a voltmeter on and tell how much power it's going to put out. Power is developed, and I have a, this is, this is what they call an Ohm, Ohm's Law wire wheel. Um, do you have a, you don't have a laser pointer, do you? I don't know how well you can see that, but. The, the power, which is the watts, um, always has to involve either current or and, and current and voltage or voltage and resistance. In other words, it's always a, it can't be directly measured. It's always something that is derived, mathematically derived. Now, we, when, I, when I was uh, learning all of this stuff, uh, calculators were really a big deal. And I know people don't like to use them anymore. But there's two sets of, of uh, mathematics things that you have to consider. Um, or not consider, but there's two, two types of math that you have, that if you're going to be a good sound guy, you really need to know them. One is Ohm's Law, uh, and the other one is decibels, which we'll talk about later uh, in, a, in a different session. But so if I want to measure the power of this amplifier, I don't have some magic meter that will measure, measure power. But I can certainly measure voltage, and I certainly know what the resistance is, so I can derive the power from the voltage and the resistance. And I'll show you how to do that. So I looked around the shop and I found a small amplifier. And the reason why we're going to use a small amplifier is because um, a big one, I don't think we can, it, they're just hard to work with. There's so much power, you know, in a, in a big amplifier. This one, I don't even know what it's rated, but we're going to find out what it'll do right here, right now. So what I have basically is a voltmeter which is probably turned off. Can you put this on one of the screens? OK. Now what I've done is hooked the voltmeter right to the output. So we're going ha to see how much voltage this will put out. The other part of the equation is resistance. Hey, Tyler. Tyler, will you put the Ohm's law back up here? Oh, I don't know how to do that. How do you do it? The back arrow? There we go. There we go. So, Okay, so this is, this is power. We know our resistance, I'm going to show you in a second, and we can measure our voltage. So the formula is P equals Z squared over R. 
And what I have are so that we don't have to run a speaker. And speakers are complex devices anyway. Uh, you, you can hardly get a power reading out of a speaker because they change so much in impedance. But this is a, a load resistor. They call it a dummy load. And all it does is this is 8 ohms, 100 watts. Okay. And all it is is uh, going to substitute where the speaker would normally go. So I'm going to unplug the speaker here so you don't. Well, I'll, I'll leave it plugged in for just one second until I show you this tone. So <clears throat> I've created a tone here. This is at one, one, 180 hertz. Um, actually, um, I shouldn't measure the power of an amplifier. You can measure it at any, any frequency that you want, but typically they use 1,000 hertz. So let me generate 1,000 hertz here. And I'll shut this one off. So I'll play a thousand. Okay. Now I'm going to, instead of uh, having the speaker on, which is obnoxious. I'm going to plug in a load resistor. Now, uh, up here, can you put my, or I have to, I have to switch out of it. I want the scope up there. I've got the scope on my screen now, so I have to close the whole thing. That's okay. I remember we were almost done with it anyway. Okay, now you can see the scope. <clears throat> now I'll go in and play. So you heard, heard it when I had the speaker put in. I'll play it here. And I'll put this out of the way. As you can see on a scope, that's 1,000 hertz. And you can see well, the meter isn't hardly putting out anything. But as I start to raise this up, I'm not getting meter. I see volts. We've lost it again, Tyler. When, <clears throat> when we came in, we lost. This is the way demos go, right? Hmm. I've lost it again. I don't know whether I have audio or not.
this. Okay. So, okay, we're there. Okay. Helps if you put the meter on the right thing. Yeah, I had it in DC mode. <clears throat> yeah, I, it's this is the oscilloscope here, and uh, I'm just trying to read the. I set it to. Sorry for that. So you can see the thousand hertz on, on the oscilloscope there. <clears throat> and if you run it up and keep running it up, eventually the amplifier gets to a point where it starts to clip. And this is literally the definition of an amplifier clip, is you're feeding it a sine wave and you see where it starts to clip, where it and if, I, if you keep going, it squares off even more. It'll only go so far, and then it'll, it'll stop. And that, how far that goes depends on the rail voltage that's feeding the output. Okay. So if you want to measure the power of an amplifier, you get it below clipping. You read the voltage, which this says it's 21 volts. Do you have your calculators, your calculators with you? This is a thousand cycles per second. Okay, so I just figured that out, and with that amount of voltage into it, and I don't know if you can see that it's fifty-five watts. That's what that amplifier is putting out into an 8 ohm resistor. Now, manufacturers like to um, hype up their specs, and so if their amplifier will do better at a lower impedance, then that's, that's the one they're going to, to say. So I have another resistor here. Turn this down for a second. And by putting two 8 ohm resistors in parallel, that gives you 4 ohms. There's the same point that we had before. And that amplifier is putting 18.5 volts out into 4 ohms. Now, if you, when you look at the formula, it'll say you divide that by 4 instead of 8. So. You square it first. I didn't do that. Hold on a second. Now it says into four ohms, it's an eighty six watt amplifier. Mm -hmm. Don't know. 
but that's one, that's one of the reasons why you'd want to do this, is to keep the manufacturers honest. And I may be able to get more, if I st step this up one more, I can get a little bit more voltage out, but it's in the clipping right now. Okay, any questions on that? No, so, yeah, so what I, what the way I like to do it is with uh, banana clips. And these, when you run that kind of power into them, they get hot. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's what happens to your voice coil on your speaker, too. <clears throat> okay. So the next uh, demo I want to talk to you about is biamplifying. Who knows what biamplifying is? Want to tell us, Jake? Yeah, it's when you uh, split the high frequency and low frequency signals into two separate amplifiers and drive your high frequency driver separate. Why do we do that? Fidelity and ultimately power, higher power output. Higher power output, better control. Those those are all valid answers. But yeah. Did you say that we can't necessarily hear what he said? Oh, okay. He he just said that. I asked him uh, what's the advantage of biamping, and he just said control, fidelity, higher output. Biamping is what? No, higher output. Sorry, what is higher. Biamp? When it's bi amp, yeah. So they split the low frequencies to one amp and the high with the other. Okay, so we just yeah, we didn't hear that. But in the beginning, that wasn't the reason for bi amping. Uh, and I'm going to do another demo for you. I have a speaker that I brought from home, um, and I took it apart. My first rule is you, you take it apart before you listen to it. But, um, and, and I split out the, <clears throat> the woofer and the crossover. So th this has an internal crossover, so it's a one way, it's not a biampable speaker. Okay. Um, and so I have this one, that, the black one that goes to the woofer and the red one that comes from the crossover. If I hook them together, it plays just like a normal speaker. But what I'm gonna do is, first I'll plug the speaker back in. After I turn the thing down here. You can hear, that's the one kilohertz tone that we just measured the amplifier with. And if I go in and generate a different, I'm going to generate it at 180. And again, you can hear the 180, okay? <clears throat> now the significance is, is that the 180 is far below the crossover point. So when I play this, nothing is coming out of the horn. It's only coming out of the woofer because the crossover is telling it, don't, you know, if you're playing this frequency, come out of the woofer only. So now I'm gonna separate the woofer. You hear nothing is coming out of the horn at all. 
and I'm going to take the output of the crossover and I'm going to plug it into my dummy load. Okay. Now if I raise this up, you still hear nothing because it's all going into the dummy load. But as I keep raising, you know it's on the scope, you're getting fewer because the frequency is lower. So you can measure frequency on a scope, you can measure voltage on a scope, you can measure peak to peak voltage on a scope. As I come up here, and I approach clipping. Oh, now what's happening? You're all of a sudden hearing it. It can be pretty significant. Now, in the old days, they used to have woofers and the, the horns were 500 cycle. And when you'd hit that point, you know, where the amplifier was clipping, you, you would really hear it a lot out of a 500 cycle horn. But this, this thing probably crosses at about 3,000. There's not an awful lot of energy up there, but there still is energy. Now we're playing this, and this amplifier is not supposed to be putting anything into that horn at all because the tone is very low. And yet when you run the amplifier into clipping, you're all of a sudden hearing it. Um, and what's causing it is harmonic distortion out of the amplifier. When you send that, that into clipping, those waves, peaks become square waves. And the square waves um, are represented in a high frequency out, out of the output of the amplifier. And so whether you realize it or not, when you clip your amplifier by putting too much into it, into a passive speaker, you're producing that kind of stuff out of the horn, out of the high frequency. That is the number one reason why biamplification was invented. Not anymore. Anymore, it's like Jake says, you know, because it's hard, you know, I mean, they found advantages of doing biamping in other ways. Um, that being said, amplifiers are not 80 watts or 90 watts. They're all 10,000 watts, you know. And so it's hard to clip a 10,000 watt amplifier. Um, there's not very many speakers that can take that, for one thing. Um, and so we, we're going to talk about headroom here in a minute, but uh, passive speakers are kind of, I see, making a comeback because you're not able to clip the amplifiers to run them up to full power anymore. Uh, uh, and so there's really no reason not to do them passive, at least not this reason. Jake's reason, yeah, there is a reason to do it that way, but uh, uh, for standard biamping, you don't get any of the harmonic distortion out of the modern. Yes, sir. Are you familiar with the company Slayer Brothers? Yeah. Is that, is that a little bit of what they were doing uh, with the passing, with the passing power? Um, because they have proprietary cables. I asked because I just went with their speaker at the Transparent Orchestra. And, um, I think they were passive, passive. That's why I'm asking. You know, if they. If I'm not sure, but it, it would make sense. That it, in other words, if they've developed the perfect passive speaker where it's got the right tonal balance and for the jobs that they're doing, his question was: Is the Claire Brothers speaker that's supposedly passive? Is it really? And I I don't know the answer to that because I don't know what they're doing, but it would make sense. <clears throat> that um, it would be passive, it could be passive. Uh, number one, you'd use less amplifier channels 
And number two is if you get everything out of it passive that you want, there's no reason why not. Because the distortion created by clipping the amplifier is no longer there because the amplifiers don't clip. Plus the fact that a lot of digital amplifiers um, uh, clip differently. In, in other words, they don't produce a lot of harmonic distortion. So um, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. They could very well be. I don't know. Anybody know what Claire Brothers does? But they're passive. They're passive. Some of them are. The new code stuff, cohesion stuff, passive. Yeah. yeah. Like I say, there would be really no reason. So did you say something about so we use a passive speaker that is the signal distortion isn't there in the same way? Yeah. What, I, what I'm saying is that in a speaker like this, what draws all of the current and what makes the amplifier clip is the low frequencies. It's not the high frequencies, typically. You know, it could be. If you get into a feedback or something of that nature, it could be. Uh, and so if you, if you feed this speaker enough, you know, to get some level out of it, um, and, and you've got a good balance between low and high, what's going to clip the amplifier is the low frequency portion of that. Um, it doesn't matter if but the amplifier clips, but what I'm saying is that when the woofer clips and you get high frequency, or when the amplifier clips, you get high frequencies also into the woofer, but they're passively low passed. And so they're not, you're not hearing those that clipping noise out of the woofer, you're only hearing it out of the high frequency. One more question. Yeah. If you use a powered subwoofer, that's bi mm -hmm. Powered subwoofer would be, well, biamping means two-way. Uh, uh, so you don't really use the term biamping with a powered sub. It's a powered sub. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it could be biamped if you said sub and a full range high pack. Yeah, that that would that would be, I guess, yeah, techni the the technically, the yeah, technically considered a biamp. Okay. I know you guys have questions. <laughs> Does, did did you get lost in any of this? Do you, do you understand? So, Makes sense. yeah. Well, um, truly, you know, that was, that was the reason why it came along. Now, we were going to talk about, oh, headroom. Um, <clears throat> the amplifier can put out in the peaks, it can put, allow your peaks to go full, fully to the rails, you know, and some amplifiers like in a, in a in a hundred watt amplifier, for instance, the rails are twenty eight volts, um, and even though you're running RMS, what you hear the whole level, it allows the peaks to go up to twenty eight volts, and there in music content there are a lot of peaks. Um, in fact, they're rated in what we call. In, in decibels, and we're going to do another class and talk about decibels. Um, but you, you uh, speech is usually between 15 and 20 dB of headroom that you need for uh, speech. So that means that you don't have that much headroom in a above, you know, RMS to peak. You don't have that much headroom, so it means you've got to run a lower. RMS if you're not going to clip the peaks in speech. Um, what else didn't we address? Do you guys have any questions? Stuart, I have a question. Yeah. I'm not sure if it fits in in this discussion, but when an amplifier is noisy in its idle state, um, where, where is that noise coming from? 
generally always coming from the preamp um, or the, the input amplifier. Um, his, Chris's question was, if you get an amplifier and you hook it to a speaker with no input and it sits there and hisses at you, where is that noise being generated? And the answer is typically in the preamp because if it's, if it's generated in the driver, there's not enough amplification between the driver and the output to create that kind of a hiss. Um, there, the amplification from the preamp is the greater one. Um, now, th there is a move afoot um, to stop rating amplifiers in watts, but to rather rate them in volts into impedance. Um, and there's a bunch of other, and it, there's a bunch of other things. It's called CAF, and it's uh, developed by uh, Pat Brown at Synodcon, um, and. It's, it's a, um, a way of, of taking amplifiers and stopping the manufacturers from, from rating them the way they want to rate them and then have every amplifier rated the same. And it doesn't really rate amplifiers in power. There's really no reason to, to mention power uh, it rates it, but it does say it'll put out 50 volts into 8 ohms, it'll put out 48 volts into 4 ohms, or something of this nature. And so this is coming. If you want to research it now, <coughs> you can go on SynodCon's website, you can download a calculator, and um, I really think it's going to win over because a number of amplifiers are instead of them manufacturers doing their own ratings, they're submitting them to a third party who, who does the ratings on the amplifier. And it's all for our benefit because if you don't have to worry about interpreting spec sheets, <clears throat> then you can uh, just read this and you can compare amplifiers directly if you have the CAF uh, standards in front of you. Yes. So 50 volts into 8 ohms or whatever, that's, is that enough information to, like, mm -hmm. you can then calculate it into... You can calculate it into watts if you want. And the calculator, the CAF uh, calculator does do that for you. But without turning it into watts, do you know how loud it is? Or? <coughs> no. Because loudness comes, the sensitivity to the loudspeaker is probably the biggest thing. Some, some speakers will put out... Um, like you, you take a ceiling speaker, it may put out uh, 90 dB with one watt into it. If it's a Bose speaker, then it's probably 80 because uh, they're very inefficient. Uh, but if you take it, something like a big Danley, uh, Danleys will put out 115 with one watt into them. That's loud, you know. And you, you can turn Danleys up to, you know, easily 150 dB. Um, and there, that's kind of two, you know, the Bose and the Danley thing are kind of two extremes, but uh, the amount of power that you required, if you wanted to get the Bose up to um, 150 dB, number one, you'd destroy it, and number two, you'd need a very huge amplifier in order to do it. Yeah, so the, the amount of level um, it's more dependent on the speaker than it is the amplifier. Yes? So I know that a lot of this we talk about efficiency. Like, is efficiency like, kind of like one of the most important things, or is there some things like, where is certain it, ones in certain classes might be less efficient than it's, more it's, desirable? It's, yeah, uh, he's asking about how important is efficiency. Um, it's really important because um, you don't want to have Gadsby put on another generator just to do a concert. You know, you, you want, if, if you're going to draw um, current out of a wall, you want it to be as efficient as you possibly can. Um, the efficiency on class a amplifiers was anything between 10 and 
25%. Very inefficient. In other words, uh, if it's only 10%, you're, you're running a 10 watt amplifier and it's drawing 100 watts out of the wall. Newer amplifiers, um, the class, well, class D's have the ability almost to be almost 100% efficient. That means if you're drawing 100 watts out of the wall, you're putting out 100 watts of audio power. Um, it's not exactly that good. You know, it's only more like 90 or 95. But um, the fact of the matter is, is you're, for the power that you have available to feed the PA, you're getting more level out of the amplifiers. And that doesn't sacrifice any sound quality or anything. Kind of like a tube amps are very inefficient for the sound kind of thing. Well, sound quality can be argued and is argued, <laughs> especially in the hi fi. There, there are guys who say, I don't want to use digital at all because they don't like what digital does to the signal. They don't, they don't like this reproduction. Um, you know, that we talked about earlier <clears throat> of taking the signal and reading it and then reproducing it. It doesn't reproduce it 100% accurately. And some guys just don't, do not like the fact that digital is messing it up. You know, uh, because er, everything is a transform. When you, when you wash your hands, say, um, <clears throat> why do you get them wet? I mean, in the natural the natural, your hands are naturally dry. Why do you get them wet to wash them? And it, it's, it's a transform because so you transform them from dry to wet, back to dry, and you transform them to wet to do an operation on them. It's the same thing with the audio signal. You transform it from audio to digital, and then it has to come back, or from analog to digital, and it has to come back to analog. And the only reason you're going to digital is to do the operation on it. Because you, what goes into it is analog and what comes out of it is analog. So the guys that are purists uh, in terms of what they believe is the best sounding audio, uh, they're generally ignoring digital. You know, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of guys that just, but, you, you look at it, and you remember analog consoles. I mean, you put two tables together, they're huge, and it, all of these inputs and all of these knobs and everything on them, and no effects that build into the console or anything at all. Now you can take a small console, have it be 100 inputs, you know, just this small thing and page through. And that's all the advantages of digital, plus you've got all of the effects that you can put with it. But um, the purest, the purest people, which which are usually the hi-fi nuts, um, they're all. A lot of them are saying analog. And in fact, a lot of them are saying we we don't like what transistors do to the signal. We want to go back to tubes. And you're starting to see more and more tube stuff come out. Uh, and so. Um, Yeah. The same people are willing to pay, you know, five thousand dollars for a power cable. Right? Yeah. Well, that's part of the crab legs, you know. Um, there's there's an outfit up north here, uh, Kimber Cable, and about every week you turn around, they've got some new way that it improves the signal. You know, uh, I mean, uh, they build a product called. Uh, I can't remember what they call it, but it's a, an outlet. It's a hospital-grade outlet that they took apart and gold-plated the, the uh, terminals inside the outlet. So when you plug your amplifier into it, you, you can't believe how much better the sound is. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's the crab legs, you know. And uh, they come from all around you. We, I was, um, at, at the shop one day and a guy comes in and uh, <clears throat> he said uh, started ripping off all of these 
specs that he wanted to meet, you know, these amplifier specs, and all of it was crab legs. And, and I said to him, well, you know, where, where are you getting this information? You know, like he wanted 0 .0005 distortion. You, you can get, you know, distortion in amplifiers, you can get them down to a tenth of a percent, but you can't get them to a thousandth of a percent. You know, they just won't go there. And I said, where are you getting all this? And he said, oh, I saw this spec, you know, that said that this is what this amplifier was. And I said, well, I can't supply you with anything like that. So. So is there, is there any harmonic distortion in many of the stuff, or is it all like... It's you, usually, there, there's two types of distortion, harmonic and intermodulation distortion. And usually what we talk about is harmonic distortion. Yeah. Yeah. Tyler. I'm just going to say, um, maybe walk us through how you would size a loudspeaker to an amplifier in a simple form, such as, you know, you've got a 600 watt loudspeaker that you just purchased, and you want to find the right sized amplifier for that. What would you or do to do that? What would be your process? Well, uh, speakers are rated a lot different than amplifiers are because uh, usually speakers will have a peak power to them. And <clears throat> uh, peak power is, um, like, like we said here, you know, I mean, if, if a speaker for a tenth of a second can take a thousand watts where it's a hundred watt speaker, but for a tenth of a second it can take a thousand watts, and if you want to reproduce that peak accurately um, for, you know, without it ever going into clipping or without it ever destroying the loudspeaker, I should say, um, you need a thousand watt amplifier to do it. So the answer to Tyler's question is, it depends, uh, you know, on, on what you're using, what you're using it for. Obviously, the more power an amplifier is, the more expensive it is. You don't want to, you don't want to, and then, and then you, you run the chance of this amplifier being a thousand watt peak amplifier or a thousand watt amplifier, it can burn up a hundred watt loudspeaker. You know, you have to be really careful there. So, um, I, I typically, in, in PA systems, I like to double them or to quadruple them. So four times the size of amplifier than what the speaker's rated. That doesn't give you really, really good peak power, but it's good enough, typically. Uh, so. Can you multiply the RMS to get the peak power, or is it more complicated? Um, you can. Um, you can go into like Wikipedia and, and uh, look up RMS, see how it's calculated, but typically um, what the specification is is that RMS is 0 .707 of the peak. Uh, and, and they did that, you know, there are just a couple guys that figured that out. And that's, that's the rule of thumb that I use, RMS is 0 .0. And that's that's in the amplifier. That's not the speaker. Yeah, Austin. So another spec that I've seen talked about with amps is amplifier stability down to a certain load. So an amp might be stable down to four ohms, or an amp might be stable down to two ohms. Yeah, what, that's that's what, a good that point. We and we we should touch on that. Um, Austin's question was, um, you know, how low of impedance can you really go? Uh, when you're feeding things. And what it turns out is you saw that this amplifier couldn't quite do 4 ohms what it did in 8 ohms. This amplifier probably 4 ohms is as, as low, low as I would load it. Now if you load it to 2 ohms it'll still play but you just won't have the power out. It, it, just, can't, it just can't keep up with it. So what does have the power out to run two ohms? Well, it's big, beefy power amplifiers with the lots of output devices um, that can run 
down that low. And um, Crown bought out an amplifier. It was the CTS series. You remember the CTS? And they thought they were setting the world on fire because they wanted an amplifier that would power an 8 ohm load, a 4 ohm load, and a 2 ohm load, all at the same voltage. So you remember Ohm's law. That means if it's loaded to a 4 ohm load, you know they have to they have to turn it down. Uh, and that drove the consultants nuts. Consultants didn't like this amplifier because uh, because of that factor. You know, they wanted it so that if you load it with four ohms, you know that the four ohm speaker is getting is getting the voltage. You know that it re really requires. So um, yeah, to get to feed to feed very low impedance. Every time you double the number of outputs, you half the impedance. And by outputs, I mean the output devices. Um, this, this amplifier here, per channel, only has two output transistors. Uh, this one, per channel, I would say would have maybe, I don't know, eight per side in order to, to get that so it'll drive a lower impedance. And there's some specifications on amplifiers. Um, these are like crowns. If you look at the, the power, what it'll do, it goes up here and falls off like this. And this would be 8 ohms here. This would be 4 ohms here. And surprisingly enough, on those crown amplifiers, their maximum power output was at 2.7 ohms. 2.7 ohms, that's three 8 ohm loudspeakers parallel. And so, you know, I mean, I don't know how long they would do that. Did I leave something on? I don't know why that meters. Oh, it's completely disconnected. Okay. Stuart? Yeah. The gain? The yeah. relationship between the knobs on the front and actual output power? Okay, so if you read a specification and it says, it says that it takes 1.4 volts to drive this amplifier to full power, <clears throat> that's with the volume control turned all the way up because all that the volume control is, is it takes the input signal and turns it down. It can't turn it up, it turns it down only. So if you're going to meet the spec, it's, it's with it all the way up. Uh, now, what was the question again, Aaron? The relationship between the uh, output power and the output power and the relationship between the input and the output Okay. 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 So if you, if you take a hi fi amplifier, which, <clears throat> which one volt will drive it to full power and you feed it with an 11 volt output signal from a console, um, what are you going to do? I mean, it's going to be into instant distortion. So the purpose of the level control is to compensate for this higher voltage that's coming into it. You see what I'm saying? Um, now, where the control is, is in my mind completely arbitrary because it depends on how much is coming into it and then how much what the sensitivity of the amplifier is to get it to go to full power. Did that answer the question, Aaron? I think so. Yeah. So you can't you can't go by this. You know, I mean they're nice, they're nice to have their they're mandatory, you know, on an analog amplifier, it's mandatory that you have um, uh, some kind of a control to compensate for the other things that are coming in. Um, we have another class that we're going to do on gain structure, and it talks about how to set these things, and 
uh, you'll find that if you in a commercial, uh, you know, just briefly a, a commercial mixer, if you're going to get good readings on the meter, then the mixer is going to put out a certain amount of voltage. You go into any signal processing, and it's got to compensate too. So the last that the last point of compensation is the knob on the front because if you're driving the amplifier too hard you know this is the way to get rid of it and, uh, and I see a lot of guys who turn the knobs all the way on up on the amplifiers and you go stand behind the console and they have no meters because they're and yet they're powering the system to its full and that that is not only bad audio, but it's also, you know, you're, you're amplifying a lot of noise because you turn these up and all, all circuitry has noise and so the mixer has noise coming out of it and so quiescent, when you've, when you've done that, you sit there, you know, turn everything, the audience has got home and you hear this hiss or hum out of, this, out of the system and it's because they've got the gain structure set improperly. And they don't have a meter, you said? Sometimes people don't have that kind of meter, or like there's something on their amp that shows them. So like your audio, your audio level meter on your console. So Yeah, um, on the console. You have to keep your console down, turned down so far that you're not seeing the meters come up at all on your consoles. Yeah. Because you have your, your meter is not attenuating on your amplifier input. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's the meters on the console the, is the ones I was reading. So I was wondering, like, how would you not have a meter? <laughs> yeah. Is yeah. there a specific place you try to shoot for with the amp settings for the volume? Well, like the amplifier, the control on the amplifier, what it is intended to do is to take your signal, whatever that is, and then, you know, uh, power the speakers with that, but if say you don't want to go as as loud or you don't want to clip the amplifier it's all done in by turning this down at the front you know because you want your console when a guy talks into it you want that to go into the if he talks really loud on peaks you want it to go into the yellow you want it to be into the high greens when when uh, you know you're just speaking normally or what, what am I reading right now Aaron, on your console. My console? Yeah. Uh, you're metering about negative 10. Okay, which is, which is several green lights, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, but you don't want it to, the yellow means you're approaching clipping, the red means you've clipped the mixer, you know, because amplifiers can clip, so can mixers. Uh, and so you, you want to set that gain up just perfectly uh, in the beginning, you know, and that's, like I say, we have a whole, whole session on just setting gains. Uh, and so the amplifier is just there to, to, you know, ideally you would, you would plug a mic into the preamp the mic preamp clip light would come on at the same time that the output meter reads red at the same time that the amplifier clips. That's the ideal situation. Yes, Tyler. Um, I don't know if you have an answer for this or not, and if this is the right class for it, but clip limiters on, a, on an amplifier and, and figuring out how to adjust those parameters Speaker you up. Do you have a process that you go through on that? Or? No, I, I, I would never. Well, for one thing, manufacturers, they're not all clip meters. Okay, uh, Crown uses something called the, an IOC. It's an input-output comparator. And uh, so what it does is takes and looks at the waveform of the signal coming in and the waveform of the signal going out. When it reaches a certain point, then it changes, but that's not necessarily clipping. It can be clipping, but it's not necessarily that. Uh, clipping on the, the light on the amplifier is a really, really good way to tell whether, you know, when, you, when you've got everything you can out of it. You know, I, I, 
I'm running this up. Uh, I'm hearing this. I just don't, I, you know, I don't want it to go any louder. The clip light's a really good way to tell that. But for setting things up, um, you know, most of that's done in the planning stage, uh, not, not necessarily with the amplifier. Um, So, um, are they are they just boxes you put between the mixer and the speaker? That's, no. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, there, there's. I would I would really encourage you. I mean, whatever. Like we touched on classes, but classes are complicated, you know, and we we could spend days just talking about the different circuit topologies that have to go through to, you know, to create a, a class of amplifier. In fact, there, there were so many um, engineers coming out with different changes in their topology of the circuit, they stopped using classes. You, you go up to class T and you're there, you know, there's, there's no more classes. Uh, they just call it, uh, a variation of this class or a variation of that class. So there are, are so di many different uh, circuit topologies you can look at. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, I mean, I used to do repairs and uh, um, uh, and that, that type of thing was very interesting to me. And so that's the way I studied it. And in reality, it's come in handy in my career because when somebody comes out and they said, well, this is a class H amplifier, you know exactly what they're talking about. You know, you know exactly how that amplifier works and what to expect from it. Uh, the first class D amplifiers were absolutely awful. They were terrible. Uh, do you remember that, Jake? And uh, I think who was the first one you saw? Was that QSC? The first one I dealt with were the uh, Magnetech successors, the, like the XDIs and okay. the side iTech stuff. Yeah, the first, the Class D came in the 90s, in probably in the early 90s. I can't remember exactly the year, but the first one I saw was a QSC, and oh, I wouldn't have given you a nickel for that amplifier, it was awful, but they kept working on it and refining it and refining it. And the biggest thing is, is that parts, there was nobody building parts for doing what they wanted to do. And so, you know, like in the power supply, there was nobody that built these transformers that are meant to run at 250 kilohertz instead of 60 hertz. There was nobody built them, you know. So, so I'm, and yet there was a lot of road groups who said, you know, this this amplifier weighs 60 pounds, and they they said I, you know, even though it maybe not sound as good, I'm gonna, it's gonna I'm gonna use the lighter weight amplifiers anyway, because the lighter weight amplifiers took it down to 18 pounds or something for the same amount of power. Uh, out so you know those amplifiers are in, evolved and now you can't hardly find a class AB amplifier I mean they they make them but uh, you most everything now is digital you know it's one of one of the other classes if you look on L acoustics uh, there's they state right on there it's a class D amp yeah Austin uh, so with, with class D's uh, you talked about output filtering yeah. Um, what determines poor output filtering and what is that perceived as? Well, uh, okay, uh, anytime you filter something, <clears throat> it involves, a, and you do it passively, it involves a capacitor or an inductor. Uh, capacitors and inductors all have a phase shift, what they call a Hilbert transform to them and they and so the, the problem with the output filtering is that what you get in 
isn't exactly what you get out in, plus the fact that filters ring uh, if their slopes are too high, you know, like so, like a first order filter, which is 6 dB per octave, you can't barely determine the ring in it, but if you get a 24 dB per octave filter, it rings. Now, some of these classes, they started to do the filtering further up in the amplifier, and I don't know exactly how those work, uh, but, uh, but that's the problem with the class D, is that you've got to filter the output, and you've got and I think they're doing it digitally nowadays. Um, and I don't, like I said, I don't know how that works, but in the early ones, it was a passive filter on, on it. But you start out at uh, 250 kilohertz, uh, and you go off at 6 dB per octave. By the time you've hit 20 kilohertz, you're pretty well out of it. You know, you don't hear any of the high frequency. But you've all heard uh, hash out of digital amplifiers and a lot of that's the digital noise, something's gone wrong with the filtering, you can hear the hash in the, in the amp. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it did, yeah, because I, I had a Class D amp in, in a bow, and we swapped it out for an AB, and that high end, and I, I, I would call it fatigue, I guess high end fatigue that came, I don't know, there's always that high hiss, yeah, but not not the input hiss, but you know something yeah. else high and just didn't sound quite right. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't. You know, as you get older, your hearing's not as good as it was when you were younger. But me personally, um, the new Class Ds sound every bit as good as the A's, but uh, maybe maybe not. You know, well, maybe they don't. Those were pretty pretty cheap Class Ds. Yeah. So pretty cheap class thing, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Carrie. So are all of these classes still made? Like, and I, because I work for sales, I get people come in all the time and they, they're very specific with what they want. And you said purists. Um, is there a manufacturer that is still making some of these others? Or, or am I looking only at old stuff on eBay? Um. <clears throat> I don't know of anybody in our industry that builds a Class A amplifier. Um, when I was young, we built these one-tube one radios, you know, and uh, they were Class A. The outputs on those were Class A, but, man, the things that they would run hot, you know, and, uh, uh, but I don't know anybody who does that. Class B, it has a technical difficulty. There's nobody going to use it. Um, class AB is very valid. That's the best compromise for an analog amplifier that there is. And so you will find class AB, the, the QSCCX series is class AB. Um, trying to think of what else. I think, I think some of the crowns that you sell are, but the Power softs are all class D. Yeah. So, one or some of your favorite real world applications that you've learned throughout your career and have applied with amplifiers? I didn't quite hear that. What are some of your favorite real world applications that you implemented with learning about amplifiers over the years? Oh. So you want to know why I think it's important <laughs> to know. Um, I, don't, I don't know of any of uh, very many applications, except that I do know that um, if I'm going to listen to something that is very, uh, that you need a lot of purity from, I'll typically pick a class AB. But if you're, if you're going to run a big PA rig, you know, you're, you're pretty well stuck into Class D. Um, I think it all boils down to, um, the reason I think it's important for you to know is because you're gonna run across this on spec sheets and, and I don't want anyone here to go home and say, now what does that mean? You know, I mean, 
that it all has a purpose. Uh, I mean, nobody's going to build an amplifier that, that is poor. Why would they do that? They would be cutting their own throat, you know, to do that. Uh, but you can tell a lot about efficiency uh, by what class it is. Uh, you can tell, you, you know, just exactly how it works. You know that it has output filtering. Uh, uh, so I don't know. I don't know how to really answer that, Aaron, except that it's been a very, very handy thing to know. Uh, for one thing, it, you, you can talk to the engineers who build them, and, and when you mention that you know about classes, then they speak to you in a different tone. Yes. What yes. happens physically to and physically and electronically when you load too many speakers? Say put four animal speakers on an amplifier. Okay, Does so it catch fire like what? Chris, Chris is asking <clears throat> what happens if you if you load them down too far, and it's what this is here. So if I put four eight ohm speakers on. Um, most amplifiers have limiting in them, so uh, they're not going to burn themselves up. Early amplifiers did. I, I remember getting in a bogan, and setting it on my bench um, at work and letting it idle, and it burned up. You know, just uh, <clears throat> called them up and said, I have this pile of ashes on my bench that's got your name on it. What do I do about it, you know? And they denied it, of course, that, that it would even do that. So I, I don't know that a lot you're going to damage the amplifier. What's going to happen is you're just, if you come down here to the 2 ohm part, look how much power you've lost. You, they just won't put the power out into, into lower. But I, I wouldn't worry too much about damaging. So, uh, yeah, yeah, the power supply just can't deal with it. Even if it did, you got these transistors in the middle of it. They can't deal with that type of current. So, Tyler. Yeah, I, I don't think you'll cause any damage. The amplifier would have to be really poor for it to cause damage, you know. But um, you, you need you need to look at wire, and I I, I don't know. I was going to talk about wire in uh, sessions that we have on speakers rather than on amplifiers, but um, <clears throat> there are charts that tell you how much uh, uh, resistance is in a wire, and if you take like a standard 12 gauge and you go something like 150 feet, uh, you're, you're approaching the point where the resistance of that wire is going to be significant compared to the impedance of the loudspeaker. So you're, you're getting losses in, in the wire. Um, you get them at 102, they may not be as much, you know, so even 25 feet you'd get losses in the wire, so you really have to pay attention to it and be careful. Anything else? Any, anybody else have any questions? Aaron. Yeah, so yeah, so Aaron Aaron pointed that out that he he used to do a demo at uh, BYU where he said that uh, as they ran the filter up, all of a sudden the amplifier stopped clipping. That's what's happened is that most of the power being sucked out of it is in the woofer, and so as you as you run your high frequency amplifier doesn't have any of these very large uh, draws or uh, it, it, your high frequency amplifier is just very likely not to ever clip. Plus the fact that high frequency drivers are not rated like they are woofers. 
Uh, when I was uh, a young guy, high-frequency drivers were rated at 10 watts. And um, then they went to 30, and then we found some that are 40. Now I don't think, I still don't think they're much past 100 watts, you know, is what they're rated at. Uh, and so, yet they put out all this sound, whereas woofers, you know, they can be rated up to 1,000 watts and, uh, or so. I mean, I should have maybe, well, in, in, the, in the session we do on loudspeakers, um, I've got some cutaway, some speakers that have been ruined. You can see how they go together, and you can see the difference in the wire sizes and the coil sizes on the woofers than you can on the tweeters. But uh, because of the nature of most music or speech, um, I think I'm, I might do in a session in two weeks, Aaron, to something like that. We're going to talk about uh, the scales, the logarithmic scales, and uh, why uh, low frequencies don't, why they have much more um, energy in them than high frequencies do. So. Yeah, we're good. Well, we've hit it almost right on. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Okay, well, appreciate your uh, attention and see you next time.